Good morning, boys of New Hope Church. I hope this message finds you all well. I hope you've all had a great day and a great week. We want to pick up our conversation still in the book of Genesis, looking at chapter 42 today. Uh, last week in chapters uh, in 41, we looked at Joseph's release from prison, as well as his interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, and then he was uh, instated as the number two man in Egypt. If you recall that, and then he started the process of storing up grain for those seven years of plenty, and then for those seven years of famine. And we finished with the idea that Egypt has done so well under Joseph's management that now they have grain to sell to other nations in the midst of this famine. It's so now we're two years into that famine is where we start uh, in chapter 42. But we really saw God's hand with Joseph, even though he was left in prison and forgotten. We saw God's hand still with Joseph and all those things. Uh, but let's start this week at chapter 42. Let's look at verses uh, 1 through 5 to get us started here. Of chapter 42, it says this. It says, when... Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt. He said to his sons, why, didn't, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to, to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. For the famine was in the land of Canaan also. So just stop there. First few verses to introduce the chapter. Um, the famine is severe. And now we're back to Jacob and his family in Canaan. And if I do my math correctly here, it's been well over 10 years um, since they sold Joseph to Ishmaelites. And now this famine's come to Canaan. And it appears that Jacob's sons aren't sure what exactly to do. Uh, I'm sorry, Jacob's sons aren't sure what to do. It seems to be kind of standing around complaining to the father, not sure what to do, expecting him to fix everything, not knowing the direction to go. And so when Jacob hears of grain for sale in Egypt, he sends 10 sons down there um, to go buy grain. He says, go buy grain. 10 of you go and get grain, but I'm keeping Benjamin back for myself, right? And so if you recall, the family dynamics for the brothers was still the same. They just transferred a different child. You remember Reuben and Judah both thought they could be um, Jacob's favorite sons, and they were kind of vying for that visit position after Joseph's perceived death. But really, that just transferred now to Benjamin, Jacob's brother, or Joseph's brother. And so those family dynamics haven't changed much for uh, Jacob still has a favorite son, happens to see Benjamin now, and the other sons are still kind of vying for his attention. Uh, but he sends those other sons, the other ten sons, down to Egypt to buy um, grain so they can live. And so as a result of them going to Egypt, they're going to run smack dab into Jacob, or into Joseph, excuse me, into their brother again. So let's look at verses 6 to 24 next, kind of a larger chunk, but we'll just look at this part together. 6 to 24, it says this, it says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, and the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where did you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now gone, is now with her father, and one is no more. And Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you from number to get your brother, and the rest of you will be kept in prison, so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest you go and take the grain back for your starving household. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, and you will not die. This they proceeded to do. Now I have to turn the page, and that's always the hard part in the Bible, isn't it? Sorry, there we go. Uh, verse 21. So they said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. 
Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now I must give an account for his blood. And they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but turned back and spoke to them. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. So let's stop there for a second here. And Joseph's brothers show up and he recognizes them, especially when they bow down to him, right? That's kind of that triggering moment when they all bow down to him. What's interesting about that is that Joseph was married and he had his first son, Manasseh. Manasseh meant the Lord has caused me to forget. And so Joseph had tried to forget his past life. He tried to move beyond his brothers and grow beyond that to be, I don't know if he was trying to be a bigger man, just trying to heal from that, that trauma of being sold in slavery. But the Lord caused me to forget that past. And so Joseph seems to have accepted his life in Egypt. He's accepted that position as second in command. He's accepted his role in the grain distribution. Joseph's kind of set up, set a life for himself. I think sometimes we get accustomed to our circumstances and we forget the promises of God. But God will always bring them back to our minds. I mean, Joseph hasn't seen his brother since he was sold into slavery 10 plus years ago. But now they come to him and they bow down to him. And it triggers that remembrance of the dream. He recognized his family. And then he treats them harshly, mostly as a test to them. Um, he's really kind of wondering if these brothers, who've almost killed one of their own, are they an advanced party in indicating a raid or attack is coming to Egypt? Now, they claim that's not the case, but he three times accuses them of such a, of being spies. Um, really to solidify that distrust of them, to solidify his, um, his suspicion of them. And when it comes time to it, he's willing to make a deal. If their testimony is true, they're the sons of one man, originally 12 brothers, one left behind, one thought dead, then all they have to do to prove that they're not spies is bring back the youngest brother. And that'll vindicate them. And so he says, you know, send one person back. But then he changes his mind and says, no, no, just let me keep one and send the other nine back. Send nine back for this young brother of yours. Bring him back and that'll vindicate your words. You won't be spies and we can do trade as we would. And so it's no wonder that when Reuben speaks up here in verse 22, he was the one that initially back in chapter 37 said, don't kill the boy, just throw him into the well. You know, that's what, that was Reuben's suggestion. Don't kill him, just throw him in the well, thinking that I'll come back and pull him out later. When he comes back, and when Reuben comes back, Joseph had been sold and he didn't know where he was. And so it's really kind of a, a, a flip here that Reuben's saying, I told you not to do this, now I have to pay for that, given accounting for what we did to Joseph all those years ago, it's come back to haunt us. And ultimately, Simeon is the one who's chosen to stay behind. We don't know if it was a volunteer. Simeon volunteered, or they cast lots, or if Joseph just picked one. But Simeon stayed behind. And the other nine are returning to Jacob to get their brother Benjamin to bring him back. And so we'll see in a minute that Joseph isn't really convinced of their change of attitude. Even though they've said these things, he's not convinced their attitudes have changed yet. So let's look at the rest of this chapter, verses 25 to 38, and see what that says for us. Yes, sorry, verse 25 says this, it says, Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened the sack to get feed for his donkey. He saw his silver in the mouth of the sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers, here it is in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to him. They said, The man who was lord over the land spoke harshly to us, and we were treated as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of one father. There one is no more, and the youngest is with our father in Canaan. Then the man who was lord over the land said to us, This is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, Take food for your starving household and go, but bring back your youngest brother to me, so I will know that you are not spies, but honest men. Then I'll give your brother back to you, and you can trade in the land. As they're emptying their sacks, each man's sack was in each man's sack was a pouch of silver. When they and the father saw the money pouches and they were frightened, the father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Reuben said to his father, May you put both my sons to death, if I do not bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. 
But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. So Jacob here is very concerned about Benjamin's safety, as we see. Um, but Joseph released his brothers and returned to the Canaan. And on the way, they discovered that their silver has been returned. And that's bad. Um, not only were they initially thought spies, but now they're also spies and thieves. So they've taken Jacob's or Joseph's generosity. He says, you can go. Here's provisions for that. Here's the grain you asked for. And now the money's back too. So now they're spies and thieves taking advantage of Joseph's hospitality. That's not good. There's serious problems now if they return to Egypt to get Simon because it's revealed if they didn't pay for the grain the first time, then they're not only spies, now they're also thieves. They're not the honest men they claim to be. And so I think the test Joseph's really giving his brothers is, is are they willing to face the consequences for the sake of another? Are they willing to face those consequences, face that challenge, that difficulty in order to uh, redeem Simeon, basically, to redeem Simeon back to the family? And when he tells, and when the brothers tell Jacob this, he is obviously very ner nervous. He's come to the conclusion that if the family returns to Egypt and if they take Benjamin with them, then Benjamin will also be lost to him. And he'll be without family, without heirs, without sons. And so he forbids it from happening. Jacob is so concerned over Benjamin's sake, he says, nope. No one's going back. What does it make do with what we have? Um, so Jacob forbids that return. It's harsh, but Jacob doesn't want to risk Benjamin in this way. It seems like he's okay losing Simeon, saying, okay, there's one more loss, but I'm not going to take any of the losses. And so he's jealously holding on to Benjamin, the only reminder of his favorite wife, of Rachel. And so Jacob is really putting themselves in quite a predicament here by not allowing them to go back into trade. So whatever grain they came back with the first time on those nine donkeys, or those nine donkeys or camels, whatever it might be, that's all they have. And so he's really kind of putting them into the into a tight corner here. But really, chapter 42 here, as we read, this begins a long narrative about Joseph and his family. It goes on for many, many chapters here. And so we've touched on just the beginning of that story today. And I want to remember a few things. First, God cares about us. Now, why do I say that? Because... God cares about us, that's true, but look at Joseph, right? He was in Egypt, he had become content within circumstances, but God wasn't going to let him off the hook for that vision he gave him. He would do whatever it takes to bring us back to him, to remind us of those promises. And I can just imagine for Joseph, it was very painful seeing his brothers again. These are the ones who sold him into slavery, have now bowed down before him. He has power over them, he can make their lives miserable. He's the one in charge now, it's changed. But God saw him through all that misery and all that suffering over the years. The second thing that I remember, and remember that with the help of the Lord, we're not the same as we used to be. And so even though Joseph's family, um, even Joseph's family changed over time, they become more concerned over family, over profit, over personal profit. And maybe the famine had something to do with that. We don't know exactly. But they're not the same as they used to be. His brothers aren't the same people. And Joseph isn't the same as he used to be. His brothers don't recognize him physically, but more than that, they don't recognize his voice. They don't recognize his speech. They don't recognize anything about him as their brother. And so we're not the same as we used to be. So God cares about us. He's not going to leave us the same as we used to be. And finally, God may put us to the test, and that's okay. See, I think the testing of God we often think is a hardship and a punishment when actually it's a confirmation for the changes he's done in our lives and God's character. It should reinforce God's promises to us, not make us run away from the Lord. And so when those tests come, yes, they can be hard, and yes, it can be difficult, and yes, it's trying, but there's a comfort there saying, God, trust me enough to be faithful to him. There's a comfort there saying, God knows my heart that I can be faithful to him in the midst of these trials. And so God may test us in those things as well. And so those are just a few things to remember, especially as we get closer or further into this, this story when his brothers come back to Egypt and Joseph's starting to reveal himself to his brothers and they want the cup and all the all the storage in the next four or five chapters we're going to go through. Um, but just remember that God loves you and God cares for you. So let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for today and thank you for this story, God. Lord, thank you for uh, Joseph's example of, of caring for others. <clears throat> and God, we're thankful that you also are faithful to us in the midst of those trying circumstances, Lord, that you will see us through and see us through safely, Lord. God, let us rest in that fact, we pray.
Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as always, thanks for joining me. I'm always glad you do. Um, next week, we'll look at chapter uh, 43 and maybe start 44 a little bit. Um, but until that time, as I said, remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people.